welcome all of you here tonight. Gather together in one accord. Amen. Welcome those of you who are joined us by live stream also. We do appreciate your fellowship very much. This will be the 61st lesson we've had in Genesis. We're going to be in the 38th chapter tonight. This is the last chapter before we concentrate on Joseph, the rest of the book. <clears throat> I don't know if there's any man that's had so much written about him. Abraham had a lot written about him, but not as much as Joseph. Unless you got the book of Job, I guess that would be a... So we're going to pick up on some, remember we're being exposed to the manner, the divine manners here, what God is like. We're learning, uh, God told us what men are like, but it's been very difficult for men to receive what, he's, what he said. Most people think there's a little good in man and what God does, he takes that little spot of good you got and he polishes it up and it becomes really a dominant trait. That's what most people believe. Most Christian people believe. They talk about new birth, but it's just, it's just talk. You can tell because church folk aren't bothered very much as a rule by the fact they're unlike God. It doesn't seem to bother them very much. But it should. 38th chapter, let me read read this, then you can rejoice that you're not teaching this tonight. <clears throat> it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adolamite, Adolamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went in under her, and she conceived and bare a son. And he, he called his name Ur. And she conceived again and bare a son, and she, and she called his name Onan. And she yet again conceived and bare a son, and called his name Shelah. And he was at Shezib when she bare him. And Judah took a, a wife for Ur, his firstborn, there's a big gap of time there. See, I remember we mentioned to you that he just leaps over big segments of time. So there's a lot of things about life that, from God's viewpoint, they're really not important. Now, that clashes with a lot of people's ideas. I think he's interested in every little thing you would do. I'm not sure this is right. <laughs> Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And Judah said unto Onan, and Did I read about Onan? She conceived again and bare a son, and she called his name Onan, yes. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. <clears throat> and Onan knew that the seed should not be his. It came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah, my son, be grown. For he said, Lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. And in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted, 
and went up unto his sheep shearers in Timnath to Timnath, he and his friend Hira the Adullamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And she put off her widow's garments from her, covered her with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath, for she saw that Sheila was grown, and she had, was not given unto him to wife. When Judas saw her, he thought her to be a harlot, because she had covered her face. And he turned un unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me, that thou mayest come in unto me? He said, Well, I will send thee a kid from the flock. She said, Wilt thou give me a pledge till I send it? He said, What pledge shall I give thee? She said, Thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it to her and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. And she arose and went away and laid by her veil from her and put on her garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend the Adullamite to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her not. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? When they, and they said, There was no harlot in this place. He returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said that there's no harlot in the play, in that's play, this place. And Judah said, Let her take it to her, lest we be ashamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and now has not found her. It came to pass about three months after, that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot, and also, behold, she's with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth, and let her be burned. When she is brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these, the signet and bracelets and staff? And Judah acknowledged him, and he said, She had been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son, and he knew her again no more. And it came to pass in the time of her travail that the whole twins were in a room. And it came to pass when she travailed that one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. And it came to pass, as, she, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out. She said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Pharaoh's. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was Zerah. I know a lot of people wish that wasn't in the Bible. But it's there, and it's there for a reason. We'll explore that some tonight. I do want to observe, first of all, that these people were not perfect. I don't mean perfect like we're not perfect. But I mean perfect like we are perfect. It's written to those that lived prior to the New Covenant, which included everyone from Adam to Moses. These all, having obtained a good report, excuse me, from Adam through Moses and the covenant. And these all having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be perfect, made perfect. Another version reads the Amplified Bible. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. There's the NIV. And behold, because God had had us in mind and had something better and greater in view for us, so that they, those heroes and heroines of faith, should not come to perfection apart from us before we could join them. Now you've got to keep that dominant in your mind when you read texts like this. You can't read these texts thinking these people know what you know because they didn't. They didn't know as much as your little bitty children know. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Being made perfect is a coin that has two sides. Sins remitted, that's one side. Nature changed, that's the other side. Now, if it is true that these old saints that did things you wouldn't do, if Jesus died for their sins and their sins are forgiven, shouldn't you be afraid to bring them up? Huh? I hear preachers bring these up all the time. They think they're smart. Oh, I don't want to change places with them. Uh, they, they, they'd cry out to the mountains if someone brought up their sins that had been forgiven. You be sure whatever you think about this text, their sins have been forgiven through Christ. Just tell, I'm going to explain why they did these things. They didn't have a change in nature. They didn't have a new heart. They didn't have reconciliation. They didn't have a new birth. Their sins weren't remitted. That's, what they, that's the economy they lived under. Before they could take place, there had to be a very real judgment against and the condemnation of sin. This had to happen before these people could be forgiven. And before we could be forgiven too. So Jesus came to take away the sin, not of not us, mm -hmm. sins of the world, Amen. which reach back that reach backward too. And the iniquity of us all, according to Isaiah 53, 8, the iniquity not doesn't say iniquities. Doesn't say iniquities. The iniquity of us all was laid upon him. That is the sin in mass. God gathered all sin into one composite whole. Way back to Adam, to the men, till the race isn't going to be any more Adamic race. And he took it all and laid it on Christ. Because no single sin could be forgiven until all sin was put away. You really have to see that. Until this was accomplished, sin kept accumulating in the human race. It kept surfacing. This vile nature that was a result of being cut off from life, this kept erupting in some of the most unusual people. It erupted. erupted. Those living before the law had the least information in the matter. Those living during the law, they had a lot more information to work with. But the knowledge base of these people before the law I can tell you, you can't imagine knowing that little. You can't, you can't, you just try and think it out, you'll find you'll not be able to imagine how little they knew. Because you already have surpassed them a long way by what you know about God and the world to come and the effects of sin and reconciliation and the devil. What's going to happen to the devil? See, these people didn't know any of that. Everything they were told had to do with life in this world. Nothing was said up to this point. Nothing was told them about the world to come or after they die or anything like that. Nothing, absolutely nothing, not a syllable. All they were told about was this world, land in this world, seed in this world, prospering in this world, that's all they were told. Now I say this, to see, this is what they had to work with. <laughs> When they faced a circumstance that was hard to face, this is all they had to figure it out. And I'm going to show you that you can't figure it out with that little knowledge. That's why these people did what we would call blunders. If we had done this, this would have been a big blunder. But they didn't have that, uh, that knowledge. See, faith can only operate within the perimeter of what God's revealed. Faith can't operate outside revelation. Amen. It's limited by revelation. You say, well, I, could have, I know about the world to come where Jesus, you was told all that. That's right. You know anything about that if you weren't told. Your faith can't go, your faith can't go beyond what you know, what you've heard from God. I don't mean personally in your closet, what God has revealed from heaven. Faith Amen. can't go any further than that. In its essence, 
faith is believing what God said. If you just kind of boil it down. And the person who really believes what God said will do what he re told him to do. Amen. That's the way it works. There's no, to my knowledge, no scriptural example of anyone who believed or had faith without some word from God. You can find it, that's fine. I, I haven't been able to find it. And as of the time of our text, God had not breathed the word about the forgiveness of sin. Sin hadn't, matter of fact, sin hadn't been defined by the laws of knowledge of sin. Sin had been defined. There seemed there appears there was a kind of an intuitive sense of morality that people had. But it wasn't enough to keep them from sinning in some form. It's interesting that the word forgive in any of its varied forms, forgive, forgiven, forgiveness, it's not found in any of its forms until Genesis 50, verse 17. Is that interesting? Yeah. <laughs> You've learned to live with this knowledge. See, you know how blessed you are. Amen. There's a whole gallery of witnesses on the other side that how blessed you are. Most of us on the other side here didn't know anything about forgiveness. Yeah. So at that level of awareness concerning sin, it didn't keep a person as pure as maybe even they wanted to be. Now these facts must temper our view of Judah. We're not condoning anything. But we're explaining why it happened, and we say, well, <laughs> if that's what ignorance does to a person, don't be ignorant. Amen. If you think it was bad when they, God hadn't revealed much and they were ignorant, you ought to see how bad it is when God's revealed something and people insist on remaining ignorant and say, insist on remaining in a having a very basic and rudimentary understanding of God, and they pass it off saying they love God, and really they don't know whether they do or not. Yeah, they really don't. Mm -hmm. They really don't know if they have faith or not. Mm -hmm. If the truth were known, you didn't know you had faith for a good part of your beginning. Yeah, yeah. Finally, you kind of grew into it. I've got faith. You, d you didn't know it right off the bat. Because, you see, it's, it passes through your understanding. What I'm making now is that these Judah, Tamar, Ur, Onan, they didn't have this. So we're not ex condoning it. We're not explaining it away. We're just saying that we can account for why it was this way. Whenever revelation is given to those on earth, it's the obligation of whoever's on earth to get to that knowledge and find out what it is. Amen. If you're the queen of Sheba, yeah, yeah. you leave your throne and head over to see this Solomon. Yeah, uh -huh. hmm? If you're an Ethiopian eunuch, you leave Ethiopia and you travel to Jerusalem mm -hmm. where you can find out some things. Yeah. God still expects this. Amen. If you know, if you actually do know of somebody who has a better grasp on the things of God than you do, you had better kind of make friends with that person. Yeah, that's, right. that's how people operate under the new covenant. Yeah, so we won't be lenient in this in our judgment, but we're going to have mercy, but temper it with mercy. So Judah went down from his brethren. <laughs> Some people say this verse it really isn't in the Bible. Some scribe wrote it in there. Yeah, I don't believe that kind of that's poppycock, theological poppycock. Yeah. It's that the person's telling you, I don't understand what it means, so it's a little bit easier to say it was just kind of someone wrote it in on a side note there. And then God, uh, God let it pass on in Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen. Don't tell me God doesn't take care of what he gives. If he does it, we're in bad shape. <laughs> Now, the word 
all scripture was given by inspiration of God was written about 1,500 years after Moses. And so if it was possible, and what Moses would have been copied and copied and copied and copied and copied and put in the Greek language and they still, he didn't say, you gotta try and find out one of those original Hebrew manuscripts, maybe one of those Dead Sea Scrolls, if you wanna be sure, that's not what Paul said. He just said all scriptures given by inspiration of God. God writes his laws on the heart of his people. And if they'll stop their ears to the stuff that's being said, they'll be able to recognize God's word. Eventually they'll come to the point, they'll say, that God said this. Amen. Eventually they'll see it. Without a lexicon. Yes. Mentioning the pursuit of such knowledge anyway, it seems kind of foolish because... And I believe the Lord's made it that way that, uh, to my knowledge, that any original writings aren't even available. So, I mean, with that in mind, it seems that the Lord just put it in place where you have no choice but just believe that it's yeah. written. Yeah. Not even like a thumbnail. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. and, the, and the earliest because it's like 400 years old. Well, it's just God, uh, here's, here's what God thinks about like original manuscripts. There's only one example we have of a handwriting of God. God, with his finger, wrote. There's only one example. So you would now, if this is man, this would be in the Smithsonian. People travel there to see it. Instead, God hid it. We're talking about God now. God hid it. In the Ark of the Covenant, if you dared to lift that lid, as some Philistines could tell you, yeah, amen. you didn't get a revelation. That's right. This is how God is. I'm telling you, this is the way God is. God insists that you believe. Amen. Yes. Yeah, to, uh, to glorify the original is to miss the, the point and purpose of it being revealed was to pass this on. Yep. Was to pass it down from generation to generation. Yes. So, uh, yeah. that, that requires faith and it requires insight to be able to do that. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's idolatry. It's just like the brazen serpent. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. And this matter of God hiding from men today the things that he did that we can read about in the scriptures. I was doing an assignment for history in school last year. And I was dealing with when... Israel crossed the Red Sea, and I googled where did Israel cross the Red Sea, and there are at least four different places where people have claimed that they have found where Israel crossed the Red Sea. So that just that just shows the futility of looking for something that God did, because we won't believe it unless we see it. The reason God has given it to us in the Scriptures is so we can believe yeah. it. Anything that is seen can't be believed. And they crossed it. They crossed it at flood tide too. Yes, that's right. Yeah. A little bit more difficult to identify. Judah went down from his brethren. Now remember, we're dealing with God now. How God's going to go about to build a nation? That's what this is. Trying, this is the phase of Genesis we're in. God promised Abraham going to have seed, and he's going to tell you now how he, how he multiplied the seed, how he produced a lot of seed. That's what this is going to be about. The words went down. There are very little. Shechem, where they were, is high ground, and Adullam is in the valley. Joshua 15 tells you that. So he literally went down like people went down from Jerusalem, went down from his brethren. Why did he go down? Well, this was God was directing his path. Amen. So far as human reasoning, I don't know why. Whether he had a tiff with his brothers, I, I don't know why. It just This is God's directing this. This is about God. This isn't about Judah. This is about God. He went down and he found a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira, and he went in to visit him. The Message Bible said he hooked up with the man. Yeah, he's still in Canaan. He's, it's in the land of Canaan, but it's in the possession of the other people. 
And a, Dol a Dolomite was a citizen of a Dolom, a city that's mentioned several times in Scripture, eight times. Some versions state that Hira was his friend and he went down to visit his friend and some others say he didn't know him but he became a friend. Well, that's, that's for all of that. I don't know. Later he's called, referred to as his friend. While he's there, Judah saw a daughter of a certain Canaanite and the Canaanite's name who had the daughter was Shua. Shua wasn't the daughter's name. It was her father's name. And he was attracted to her apparently. He went, went, in, went in to her. That's interesting, isn't it? Now, Abraham didn't allow Isaac to marry a Canaanite. And Isaac didn't allow Jacob to marry a Canaanite. Judah marries a Canaanite. It's just kind of, you can make out of that whatever you want, but it's an interesting observation. It, among other things, it tells you that faith can't pass from one generation to the next. This has been a big disappointment to a lot of people. They wondered why their faith couldn't in, couldn't pass down to their children. Mm -hmm. Which one of us wouldn't like it if it could? I mean. yeah. uh -huh. But the truth of the matter is, it doesn't. God has no grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Every person has to believe for themselves. Your, your mama can't believe for you. Amen. Your father can't believe for you or any other of your relatives. you got to believe for yourself. They can raise you up and train you now. That they can do and acquaint you so that you have some kind of working acquaintance that when, when finally you confront the Lord, you have enough sense to obey Him. Amen. But you can't, it can't pass from generation to generation. Don't try and take responsibility. Like if you'd have done better, it wouldn't have happened and all this. This is just, this is a waste of time. Yeah, and Satan will bludgeon you over the head with this yeah. till you will hardly be able to stand up. So this, do you think Isaac was home weeping, weeping, weeping because, or Ju Jacob was weeping, weeping, weeping? Isaac, he's, it grieved him, but I mean, they didn't like, their lives didn't end at that point when Esau married a Canaanite woman. So he goes down, he marries her. Later, God's going to tell the Israelites, don't take their wife. But that's after they inhabit the land. Now, I don't desire to take this matter too far, but it seems to me that from Abraham to Judah, the faith kind of deteriorated. I can't imagine like Abraham doing this, but uh, that's just a personal observation. For men, this had created impossible circumstance. You're, Anyway, and they fall into sin. The times, regardless of their inferiority, will not hinder the Lord from fulfilling His will. Amen. I mean, it may be bad times, but God will find Noah. Yes? It shows that now this that we see is kind of evident from Abraham to this point begins to decline. Yeah. We say that God... We can see that God is responsible for maintaining His salvation. That's right. It's never, it's never dependent on men. If God hadn't been underneath this, no. holding this up and, and maintaining this and doing whatever He needed to do to bring about His purpose in Christ, well, it, it's not of men. This is what we see. That's here right. For sure. If He hadn't have been, this would have been, this would have never been nothing compared to what it would have been. Yes. Tony, that's a very good observation. I think that, that may be the only reason this passage is in here, is to illustrate that oh, very point. Yeah, I that, do nothing, that nothing can stop mm -hmm. this no. promise of God from, See, from being fulfilled. What it's going to boil down to is this this chapter is going to account for Pharaoh's, which is in the Messianic lineage. That's right. And it's the only place we yeah. we know anything about Pharaoh, but that's he Pharaoh's, who was in the Messianic lineage, was born under these circumstances. Right. How about that? Amen. And that very principle is going to be illustrated in a more lengthy example in Joseph. That's right. In Egypt. That's right. Yeah. So it's just, it's just a commentary on God working. See, God's God's purpose is going on 
It's not going to drop it's drop to the floor because of these circumstances that look pretty bad. Admittedly, they look pretty bad. Judah takes the Canaanite to be his wife. She was her father. And she conceives and she bears three sons. This is Judah. Judah. Judah, you know, Jesus is a lion of the tribe of Judah. Yeah, that's right. He's a run account for Judah's first three sons. She conceived and brought forth a son and called his name Ur. Scriptures say that Judah named him. And then she conceived again, and his wife, his mother, named her, named him Onan. Then she conceived a third son. Sheila. Now, the, the God, Er is the oldest, firstborn. He's firstborn, firstborn of Judah. So he takes a wife for, for him named Tamar. And he turns his attention to, to Er. He was, a, he was wicked in the sight of the Lord. Now, wicked in the sight of the Lord, this is really bad at these times here. This is really, really bad. This is a steal of watermelon. This is really bad yeah, stuff. Right, yeah. Hey, what did God do? God killed him. That's right. Why is that in the Bible? You think God's changed so he wouldn't kill you if you irritate him? Do you really think that? People need to think this stuff out. Yeah, amen. Stop their ears of some of this Mamby pamby stuff that's being said about God. Here it is in the Bible. He was wicked in the sight of God and God slew him. Amen. How he did? Maybe people round about thought he died of an illness or something. Maybe a bull gored him or something. See? Yeah. But it was God that did it. Amen. Why? He just didn't want him around. Yeah. Firstborn son. Yes. He was a child of the wicked one. That's right, that's so right. God didn't slew, kill him. No, but let him but wander. This, but this is illustrating that the principle that's stated elsewhere in Scripture, I'll have mercy on whom I have I mercy. Mm -hmm. so there is a sense in which God could kill any of yeah, us. That's right. He could have mm -hmm. killed any of us. Mm -hmm. And he There's hardens whom he will. Yeah. He hardens whom he will. Mm -hmm. So if you're not hard, yeah. God didn't want you hard. So you need to dive right into that mercy and grow up in the knowledge of the Lord, see? See, sensitive people can use this and kind of measure them yes, themselves. If they're sensitive to the Lord, if it's easy to forget God and easy to indulge the flesh, and you've got reason to fear. Amen. Now, this, like you said, this is all being set up by the Lord. So this, right. <laughs> the fact that, you know, in this case, he, he's going to take extreme measures to set this circumstance up. That's right. <laughs> this had something to do with Judah's line. That's right. That's I mean, there, there, there's particular sensitivity here. That's right? right. Because the Lord, the Lord in His plan, He knows how He's going to use Judah's line. That's mm -hmm. right. Right. Remember, Amen. Cain's line was cut off. That's, That's right. right. There are no more descendants yeah. of Cain in the earth. That's right. Yeah. And I, I, well, I'll wait till I get to this other point. It's one thing to be a sinner. Everybody's a sinner by nature. It's another thing to be wicked in the sight of the Lord. That, that's kind of a low, it's descended low into the pit. So God judged him. He's unworthy to live. Now we turn to his secondborn son, Onan. Judah, now God hadn't said this like he did under the law, but people seem to intuitively we know this that families were big things because the Jew because it's a Jewish and the Jews flesh and blood was a lot because the God was developing a flesh and blood lineage that lead right up to the doorstep of Christ so this is a protected lineage and uh, so he tells on and you go in and take her for your wife so you can raise up seeds so the family name will continue through the firstborn is the idea. Later under the law, this procedure was codified under the law. 
Deuteronomy 25, 5 and 6 says, If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to him to wife <coughs> and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she bears shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. Yeah. See, that was God's way of keeping the family going on. It was necessary prior to the new covenant. Mm -hmm. See, under the new covenant, bloodline means nothing. Yeah, that's right. yeah. mm -hmm. It does. It doesn't mean a thing. Yeah. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah. We're born not of flesh, yeah. not of the blood, mm -hmm. not of the will of man. See, there's a different blood. There's a different line. Bloodlines. The Christ. The Christ bloodline. See, first, those that are connected with Jesus aren't connected by the earthly lineage. But that earthly lineage, which had to be in place to prove Jesus was the Messiah, that's why this is being reported to us. This lineage is being reported. Well, Olin, uh, he doesn't want to do this because. He, he wouldn't receive the children, wouldn't wear his name, see. Yeah. So there's, been, there's a lot of stuff said about this event of Onan. Mm -hmm. I grew up hearing all this. Mm -hmm. But the text says that Onan did go into her. Uh, right. yeah. But he didn't consummate the... Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying here. Mm -hmm. See, there's all kind of... <laughs> stuff said about this passage I'm not going to even mention it but uh -huh. it, he did go into her mm -hmm. but he didn't consummate the yes, right. the union mm -hmm. right. now there under ordinary situations there could be no mingling of the seed mm -hmm. but there are some extraordinary cases where where God just showed his grace Tamar is going to be an example mm -hmm. she was a Gentile Rahab a harlot she was a Gentile Ruth was a Moabitess. They weren't allowed to come in the house of God for all their life. So there's some little traces of grace in the lineage of Christ. There's little Amen. traces that tell you this is all arranged by grace. Mm -hmm. So the thing that dictated this family line wasn't the lineage itself. It was the God who produced the lineage. Yes. Onan had no interest in maintaining his brother's house. So the, and God was uh, angered by it, and he slew him too. So there you have his first two sons. God killed them. Same thing happened to Aaron. Made Dab and Abihu, his first two sons, they were son, killed. And Eli's sons, first two sons, they were killed too. So you think you've got a thing to break your heart? Think of these men. Think of these men. These weren't adopted children. These are firstborn sons. There's three men in the scripture we know. They're firstborn sons, and God himself killed them. Yes. All, th all three cases, it tells you God did it. Remember after Aaron's sons, fire consumed them. Right before their eyes, they saw it. Him and Moses saw it happen. Moses said, this is what God meant when he said, I will be glorified before the people. And there's a, something said about Aaron there that tells you what a great man he was. He said, and Aaron held his peace. Yes. Amen. Amen. He knew. See, he'd, I'm not going to question God on this. No record that Judah questioned God on this. Well, a lesson that we learned from this, as I've already mentioned, is when anyone's sins are remitted, you don't mention them. When there are now no record of them being remitted, then that means they're in the record as a warning. Yeah. And the record is a warning. God hasn't changed. Now here's another thing to observe in this. Prior to the day of salvation, a consistent life was very difficult. Very difficult. You know, man, first time he sees this woman, he wants her. He, he just, 
He didn't have the kind of control God's asked you to have. And you'd, you'd feel like he did if you didn't have God's grace. From time to time, people associated with God are recorded as doing things that nobody in Christ would dream of doing. So I reason that the deficiencies by the New Covenant standards were found in ancients were strictly owing to the limitation of their faith. And uh, after Judah told her, you stay, you remain a widow till my younger son Shua, till he grows, Sheila grows up. When he grows up, I'll, I'll give him to you and he'll raise up the seed. So in the process of time, he leaps over period, here we go again, leaps over a period of time. Process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. We do not know the name of Judah's wife. See, there's another kind of an unnamed woman, don't know who her father was. We know the name of Abraham's wife, Sarah. We, we know the name of Isaac's wife, Rebecca. We know the wife of the wives of, of uh, Jacob, Leah and Rachel. See, we, we know that, but we don't know. There are some people, whether you want to admit it or not, that in the Bible are really nobodies. They're not named. That doesn't mean in the ages to come they won't be named, but for the scriptural record, it was just best uh, that they not be named. And the scripture says Judah was comforted. Being comforted was not a special ministry that one of Judah's peers performed. Actually, in those days, there was a period of time assigned to mourning. People would mourn the, mourn the dead, the godly dead. When Jacob died, the Israelites mourned for 40 days. And when the clan came to the threshing floor of Atad, they mourned for seven more days. The Egyptians mourned for uh, Jacob 70 days. When Aaron died, they mourned for him 30 days. They mourned for another 30 days when Moses died. So during the days of those mourning, the grief of the heart, here's the, if I may say, philosophy of it, the grief was poured out. Now, I have known people in my ministries that 20, 30, 40 years after their loved ones died, they're still grieving. And it's not a small number. The Jews didn't allow that to happen. They poured it out. Maybe it took 40 days, 50 days, whatever. They poured the grief out and got rid of it. God doesn't intend for people to live with grief over something they can't change. But he knows there is going to be grief. So he, his people, this, well, this is how they, how they handled it. But comforted means the time of mourning was over. He resumed, resumed life. Didn't carry it the rest of his life. Now Judah resumes his life and he goes up with his friend Hira, the Adolamite. Time to shear the sheep. I would think you couldn't be grieving while you're shearing the sheep. So he got his mourning out of the way, went up to shear the sheep. Tamar heard about it. Somebody, some, see, they, they were kind of open to what they did in those days. They, news traveled fast. They didn't have telephones and internet and stuff like this, but folk, news traveled. Yeah. Tamar said, Judah's coming up to share the sheep. So a, uh, Tamar takes her widow's garments off, and she covers her face with a veil, and she wraps like a, somebody like a large cloak around her so that she'd not be recognized. I don't know how long Tamar had been wearing these 
widow's garments, but it apparently had been for some time, enough time that she had grown up. She then positioned herself in an open place that led to Timnath. You remember a Samson? Mm -hmm. he, he went to Timnath. Yeah. Positioned herself on the road with an open place so that someone on the road, road had to pass by her sitting there. She did this because, the scripture says, she saw that Sheila was grown and she was not given to him to wife. Yes. Now the thing compels Tamar to do something. She, she doesn't know very much. I don't know if she knew anything at all about the Lord. I don't. She was a, she was sort of a Canaanite. She didn't. She didn't know about prayer like Rachel when she had twins. She had some abnormal activities. She knew enough to inquire of the Lord and get an answer. I don't think Tamar knew to do this, so she's going to use her own wisdom, which we see is not really sufficient. But people don't know that. you gotta, you got to stick that under their nose. God tells you the wisdom of the world is foolishness. He comes right out and tells you that. But these incidents are in here. These are the best people. You the best thinking they could. And so far as just our inc that incident standing by itself without regard to God, that's the best Tamar, Tamar could do. She'd waited patiently at her father's house. She's a mature woman. Now this is further, further complicated. She probably didn't know anything about the Abrahamic lineage and the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and she didn't have information about all of that. Yes. I think this is a this is an illustration in Scripture of of the principle that God has put in man a basic sense of right and wrong. Yeah. There is a basic yeah. universal sense. Yeah. Most people understand that there are some things that are just right, yeah. and there are some things that are just wrong. And th this is part of the maybe it's part of the divine image or. It's conscience. The scripture talks about the conscience yeah. of man. Here's a woman who did not know God. Yeah. And yet she and she yeah. has a basic sense of right and wrong. That's right. Now, in our time, see I think we a lot of Christian people don't give enough credit to to like pagan or unbelieving yeah. people. God has God has put this in Amen. man. God has put this in man. Amen. And, and one of the reasons he's done it is so that man would seek him. We, we know that from Scripture, that God has he's placed people in certain places. He's given us this sense of right and wrong so that men would seek him. Mm -hmm. doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean they'll find him, but they, they, seek, they should be seeking him. Amen. You're absolutely right. So Sheila was grown. So are you going to have a, a man-child? We don't recommend you use the name Sheila, but it's a, it's a man's name here. It's further complicated, as I say, by the possibility she was not had no working knowledge of the Abrahamic lineage and everything involved there. Well, Judy's traveling along the road. He sees her. Evidently, harlots cover their face in those days. <laughs> These days, they paint them up and stick them right under your nose. But in those days, he covered her face so that nobody knew who she was. He thought he thinks she's a harlot. And he said he turned in over by the way. She left the road and went over where she was sitting. He said, let me come in under thee. See how modest that is? I debated on whether to read what some of the other versions say. I'll, I'll step out a little bit scary and timorous. These are what some of the Bibles. One of the common ones, the NIV and several others are, let me sleep with you. Let me lie with thee. Come on, let's sleep together. Good's God's word. Let's, let me have intercourse with you. <laughs> this is in the, it's in the Bible. Yeah. I want to have, I don't want, I want to read the rest of them. You know what they are. Now, there's no way 
that a translator can get that language out of the Hebrew words. There is no way. The Hebrew words meant just exactly what the text says, let me come in to you. It's in, let me go where you are in your dwelling. Why? Why does God speak that way? Because he's not that kind of language awakened stuff that we don't need to have awakened. The role of a translator is not to explain what the Bible means. That's not a translator's business. He's got to stay out of there. The translator's business is to tell us what, the, what God said. Now, as preachers and prophets and so forth are the ones that explain what it means. But there's a lot of confusion on this. All these new versions of the Bible are attempts to make the Bible understandable. But I'm not sure God wants the Bible understandable. Amen. What are we going to do then with apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers? What are they going to do? Everybody just stay home and read the Bible? Is that it? He intends, he intends for his word to be vague enough that you'll press in and try and find out what it means and seek after it to understand it. <laughs> well, she's pretty wise, Tamar is. She says, what wilt thou give me? I mean, well, like, what's, what's it worth to you? I'll give you one of the kids out of the flock. Nice young goat. Yeah, she says, oh, how am I going to know you're going to come back and give it to me? Well, you have to give me a pledge. You have to leave something with me here. Like, uh, he said, what do you want me to leave you? Well, she says, give me your signet. That was a ring that had the stamp of their official logo, so to speak, on it. Bracelets, it said, it's general consensus that the bracelet was actually something the ring was hung on, so he would go transact business and seek his ring and stamp it. I want that your signet, seal, like a notary seal, and I want the thing that it's hanging on, and I want your rod. Now that's the first blockade. That's the first blockade to not doing this. Yeah. Because those are things he needed. He couldn't like leave this. He knew he could not leave this forever. He, he had to get come back and get these. So it's a blockade thrown up. Modest check. And uh, though he consents, he consents to do this. See, the law wasn't written on his heart yet, like the New Covenant sense. He goes into her, and she, she conceives. So he goes back, so he's done with the sheep and cheering the sheep. He goes back and he remembers about this kid. So he sends Hira with the kid and to pick up his pledges. And uh, he can't find her. And he asks, so they said, there's never been a harlot, never sit by the road here. We don't have, no harlots do business here. He goes back and he, he tells Judah about it. And Judah responds in a, out of a unique way. He says, all right, he said, uh, You just said, let her take it to, to her. What he's talking about is pledge. Let, let, let her just keep the pledge. She can keep the pledge. Leave the goat there. She can, she can keep the kid of the goat. Now, we, we made an effort. We made an effort. He said, otherwise, we'll look foolish. If we, if we keep going back, keep going back, we'll look like, we'll look like fools. We, we can't do this. And I noticed uh, Judah hadn't been concerned about his reputation when he went into her. <laughs> he wasn't thinking about his reputation. But when he, when he faces this, he's thinking about his reputation all of a sudden. That's what happens, see, when, a, when, when you're not conscious of God and when you've got a little parts amount of information to work with, you can't think far enough out to keep out of trouble. Yeah, that's right. Now, three months later, I imagine Jude had figured out all about this. He didn't know she conceived. I seriously doubt that Tamar knew she conceived at that time. Uh -huh. 
It reads like right, right then. No, it's got reporting. Just so you know, she's with child. Just so you'll know, this is this is Judah's child. She conceived, and it was reported to uh, Judah. And of course, they soon the worst thing. They said she's played the harlot. She's went out and uh, given herself away. But sin will not remain in darkness. God's teaching you that too. He said, you may think you hit it really well, but a bird will tell it. You ever saw that a bird will tell it, carry the news. Some be, sins will find you out. Now this has got to be taught to our children. I can't be with you all the time. I can't, but be sure. Your sins will find you out. They'll chase you down. And you, you, may, you may think, because you forgot them, God forgot them, don't. Don't think that way. Some people's sins are punished in this life. Some won't be punished till the day of judgment. That's what Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 5, 24. Some men's sins are open beforehand. All right, you just, everybody sees it. This is what, God is showing you Jacob's sin. Now, he probably would be more comfortable, Jacob would be, if he didn't tell us. He showed us David's sin. He showed us Moses' sin when he hit the rock. See, this is God. He's teaching us. He'll show yours too, unless you handle it, yeah. take care of it. Amen. So it's a slice of wisdom and understanding to be included when you raise your children. I, I, I don't think people do what's much these days. I was I was fortunate enough to be raised up with this kind of ingrained in my thinking. But you can't get by with sin. Better to warn them about moral requirements when they're young. They won't give you trouble with them when they're young. Just when they get old and older and think a little, little more highly than something they ought to think, then's when their hearing gets kind of bad. So tell them when your hearing is good. Pass it on to them. Three months later, his immediate, eh, bring her out here and slay her. Now God's monitoring this situation. They didn't. They didn't do that though. Why? Because God's managing this, this whole thing. See, the law later, the law later did tell the people to do this. Here, here's the law. Deuteronomy 3, 22, 23 through 24. If a damsel as a virgin be betrothed unto a husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of the city, and ye shall stone both them both with stones that they may die. The damsel, because she cried not. She what? <laughs> this is God talking. She didn't cry out. And the man, because he humbled his neighbor's wife. See, so they, they didn't both commit the same sin. So we hope that not, no one ever attacks any of our young ladies. Yeah. If they do, scream as loud as you can. Yeah. Yeah. This is what he said. You didn't cry out. Right. Telling you, we, don't, we hope nothing, we don't want anything of this to happen. But I have faith in God that he'd open someone's ears to hear the scream. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. Of course, none of this that we just read has been revealed at that time. Yeah. How different Judah now thinks of holler tree. Oh, now, now he's thinking a lot different than he did before. Now he has a penchant for moral purity. Bring her forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's flesh. That's how flesh thinks. Judah's response was much like David's. You remember when after he'd yeah. committed adultery with Bathsheba, Nathan came sent by God and told him this little parable, you remember? About a man had one little ewe lamb, just one little ewe lamb. And he went over to this other fellow who had a big flock and had a friend come over. He took one of his ewe lambs and killed it and served it up on a platter. David said, 
As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Yeah, and before he dies, he was... And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said, um, you're the man. And David, of course, he repented in the 51st Psalm is his penitential psalm. When she is brought forth, Tamar, or she come, to be taken out to be killed. She brought her pledges with her. She's a shrewd woman. Brought her pledges with her. Of course, God's working in this woman. He wants Judah to be more holy, and he's worked this circumstance. Uh, it was going to be remembered. And she she sends these pledges by somebody else to Judah and said, probably publicly said, the man who did this, he gave me these things here. And she said, um, Examine them and see if you can know the person. <laughs> and of course, he, he saw them where they were his. And he said, she hath been more righteous than I. She's more in the right than I, one version reads. By this, Judah means that Tamar was driven by a more noble purpose. She wasn't seeking fleshly satisfaction. She was seeking the carrying on of her name. See, she had a more noble purpose than, than Judah had. So Judah traces the whole thing back to a cause for which he himself was responsible. Because I gave not her not Sheila, my son. He saw right away. He saw right away. Now all of this, all of this that we've read here, verifies God's assessment of the human race. This is the way God is. He, it's enough that God says it, yeah. Amen. but see, He verifies it by picking the the premier members of the human race, and He shows that they needed a Savior too. God revealed this to Noah after the flood. After the flood. He said, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. That's why he wouldn't destroy him anymore. He'd have to, every generation or so, would have to wipe the earth clean. Solomon said, there's not a just man on earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, who can know it? David twice stated, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any, any, that did understand and seek God, they all gone aside. They all together become filthy. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. Two times he said that. 14th Psalm and the 53rd. Paul quoted that Psalm in Romans 3.10. David confessed, Behold, I desire truth in the inward parts. In the hidden part thou hast made me to know wisdom. He also said he was born in iniquity and sent his mother conceived him. So these, this text proves that that's true. Yeah. We don't have to speculate about it. So they bring these factual views of Judah and Tamar. We're setting forth as an, ex and an, as an example of what sin did to the human race. Yeah. See, now, of course, if you, I don't, I don't know one here does, at least I don't think anyone here accepts a theory of evolution but if they do, you, you don't have this problem. Because the theory of evolution doesn't deal with the introduction of sin. It doesn't tell you who the first man was, doesn't tell you who the first marriage was, doesn't, it doesn't tell you anything that we really need to know. Amen. We're the ones, we should tell evolutionists, look, we got the answers. We can tell you who the first man was, we can tell you who the first sin was, who the first woman was, who the first birth was. We, we know all that stuff. Amen. They don't have anything. So the Spirit sums it all up by accenting the effectiveness of salvation, saying these were not made perfect without us. So this record is a not made perfect record. It's a not made perfect record. There it is. 
Well, time passed again, and we find Tamar in travail. And twins were in a room. Apparently she didn't know it, nobody else knew it, but twins were in a room. A uh, midwife is there, and one of the twins, his hand, comes out. I remember in the birth births with the Hebrews, who's born first? This is like a critical fact. Now the midwife, she's an alert woman. God must have had her there. She ties a scarlet thread around the hand of the came out, and the baby pulled the hand back in. And the other one was born first, and then the last one born had the scarlet thread. Just like Esau and Jacob. First one born, rejected. Here, the first one born really was really the second one. Uh -huh. yeah. Right? I take it that God moved the midwife to act quickly. I don't matter that babies probably didn't stay there in that position for a long time. I'm going to tell you what in all of this, what I think God was, something God was doing. This all confused the serpent. I just, serpent's got to work with this kind of stuff. We, we're told what was going on. He, he, he wasn't told. And I think this, this complicated matters for the servant. First, first, you know, he thought, he thought that Cain was the promised seed. That's, that's what he made people. And Eve said, "I've gotten a man from the Lord. This, this is the one." Well, it wasn't the one, and Satan's been confused ever since. He never did. <laughs> and God so garbled up the genealogy. He had to reveal a genealogy, or how would you like to figure it out without Matthew and Luke? I mean, so he confused the enemy. And if you trace through the genealogy of Jesus, particularly uh, Luke traces it all the way from Jesus back to Adam. Matthew traces Jesus back to Abraham. But you'll find evidences of grace all through that genealogy. I list, I just go back a couple of thousand years from Jesus to Judah. Most of the people, we have no idea. They're just nothing but their names there, that's it. And you gotta, once in a while he'll go at length, he'll say now, there is a King David, the father of Nathan. You see, he, he tells you about David, he elaborates a little bit about David. He elaborates about Pharaoh, as Luke does. He says, Pharaoh, which was the son of Jacob, which was the son of Isaac, which was the son of Abraham, which was the son of uh, Terah, which was the son of Nacor. That's Pharaoh, he said enough. Yeah. Well, if we didn't have this record here, yeah. we would know nothing about Pharaoh at all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So see what God did to produce Pharaoh? Uh -huh. He had this old network that he orchestrated all this. Right. He arranged all this Amen. so only he could work his purpose out through, Amen. through this Amen. Right. web, uh -huh. so to speak. Amen. And something else is interesting to note in the genealogy. The genealogy continued on during what's called the intertestamental period from Malachi to John the Baptist. There's no record of any prophet there, no scripture written there, but the genealogy kept on going through that Amen. see <laughs> testamental period so in Genesis we're particularly a, have had some events told about Judah and how this how his contribution to the messianic seed uh, came about only one of Jacob's 12 sons was in the messianic lineage only one as Judah the Levitical priesthood goes back to Levi see but Eleven of the sons, see, this, see what I meant about confusion to Satan? Here you got twelve sons. Hmm, which one is it going to be? Then you got Jacob and you got this 
hodgepodge we just read about. Yeah. <laughs> and you got his offspring, first first two offspring. You got that situation, but yeah. see, God worked all that out. Yeah, amen. Now what you want to do when you read something like that, mm. you can say, God can work out my circumstances amen. too. Amen. It's God that works uh -huh. in you, both the will and do of his own good purpose. Yeah. And from time to time, you'll be able to, to see God's hand. You can see, you, from time to time, this will happen. And you'll be able to see, oh, as God arranged that. This is of God. He did this. You'll be able to see the hand of God. And when you do, think back about Judah and the 38th chapter of Genesis. That's before we started on Joseph. Then, then we take out the Messianic lineage, and it's not even Joseph is going to be the one that's going to be the sparer of the people. He's going to save much people alive. Amen. God's going to send them down where they have to be kept by his hand. He's going to turn Egypt against them, so it's going to look like they're never going to get out of there. You're going to leave them there for 400 years so that any any fleshly hope will wither and die. And we're on this side. We can read it all in a brief period of time. But see this? I'm, they went through a lot, yes, these ancients. Yes. So I, I stand in tribute of them. Yes. I'm, I, I think I could say if it was, I don't believe I could have navigated through that. I, the Lord would, of course, could give you grace, but... That's so right. Then you have to figure everything out yourself. Yeah. Can't go in your prayer chamber and just pray. Can't go home and say, "I'm going to look and read in the scripture, see if I can find something in the scripture about this." See, they didn't have any of that. That's right. It's but God made them stand. Amen. He made them stand, and He kept them from falling. You know, it's a great text, isn't it? And if you want to add, yeah, both Jason. Yeah, this is one of those passages that gives us a, quite a bit of insight into human nature, oh, sure as you've already as you've already expounded. So, but I, I did want to highlight a couple of thoughts. Go ahead, yeah. The, uh, the Paul says in Romans that, that there are there are Gentiles who do. He says, of course, yeah. even though they don't have the law, they do things They're contained in the law. Yeah. But the law would say. And this is what we call conscience or something like that. As I was talking about earlier, every person has been given this, this moral sense from God. However, the point there in Romans that Paul develops is that people don't consistently live by that moral That's right. sense. That's right. And so in the argument there in Romans, he says, all have sinned and fallen short yeah. of the glory of God. So, so Jewish people had the law, but they broke it. They broke it. The Gentiles... They had, they had, the, they had this thing called conscience, which means the word conscience means with knowledge. So God has given this moral sense to people, but, but see, nobody lives it consistently. That's right. That's this is illustrated in this story. Amen. And nobody's consistent. Yeah. Uh, the natural man is not morally consistent. Amen. Even the best. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, and another thing we yeah. see here is that human nature is is inherently self-righteous. That's right. <laughs> people will give themselves a free pass, yeah. and they'll condemn other people for the same things that they're yeah. doing. That's right. So in a sense, everyone's inherently hypocritical. <laughs> this is part of the natural That's right. And this, this and as you said too, this is put in here as a warning. Don't be like that. Yes. Better not be like that. Jesus said, He says, don't don't try to. Take the speck out of your brother's eye when you've got a big giant two before <laughs> sticking out of your own. In other words, don't judge other people while you're ignoring your own sin. This is not right. That's right. Amen. God, God does not Amen. condone this at all. That's what Judah did to Tamar. He said, she's more righteous than me. Remember, he, yeah, then he yeah. saw it. Well, he saw it then. Yeah. But, but it's better to learn those things another way if you can. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think Judah did learn it because we see years later him offering himself yeah. mm -hmm. as a sacrificial replacement for yes. Benjamin. That's right. Keep me here, That's let right. him go back. That's right. That's right. I yeah. think he did. I think yeah. he did. Amen. He benefited from this experience. Yes. Amen. All right. I have a word of prayer.
prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this record. We do stand in appreciation of Judah. We're thankful that he recovered and that he himself stood in behalf of Benjamin. We confess, Father, that were Jesus not in us, we would do things probably a lot worse than this. So we're grateful for redemption, for salvation. We thank thee for forgiving the saints that were not made perfect without us. We're thankful that the blood of Christ reached backward and purged them, and we will not remember them and for the faults they committed, but for their faith, which always managed to surface. Help us to learn these lessons from your scriptural accounts of the members of the of your the lineage of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.